Welcome back, scholars. I hope you all are doing well. Do you stay? I want to uh, record a lecture on chapter two, uh, frequency distributions. Uh, this is a foundational chapter uh, that will utilize um, your skill level in being able to identify um, how to develop and how to create graphs and tables uh, using what we call frequency counts. Uh, we'll talk about what frequency counts are. Um, you know, they might, frequency and frequency counts may, the, the definition may vary uh, depending on what field of study you're in. Um, but for statistics and for st statistical purposes, we're going to use frequency counts uh, pretty consistently across, uh, you know, behavioral science fields. Um, but again, in other fields, it might be different. But um, I'll define what a frequency uh, distribution is. I'll define what a frequency is. And, and then we'll kind of move on to how we calculate, how we design, how we uh, create uh, tables and or graphs uh, based on, uh, you know, data that we have collected. Okay. So let's get started. On... Right. All right. Uh, so here's some of the learning outcomes that uh, you'll be, you should be familiar with. Um, so by the end of the lecture, uh, you should have a general understanding of these things and be able to do these things as we move forward. Um, so, you know, organizing a frequency distribution table, uh, you know, we'll have some, some practice problems at the end of the chapter, uh, at the end of the lecture, um, that you'll be required to complete um, to under to give me your understanding, show me how, how much you understand the information that we uh, present. Uh, and then the last one says no one know how to interpret and understand graphs. Again, that's a very, very big skill. Um, you think about looking at a uh, peer review paper, peer review research paper, usually they're going to have graphs and tables and you, as a researcher, have to be able to read, read the graph, read the table, be able to understand and interpret what's going on um, in the table. All right, so proportions, scales of measurements, again, all this stuff we saw uh, from either the skills assessment that we took, uh, so knowing knowing how to calculate proportion, knowing how to calculate uh, percentage, um, and then also the scales of measurement that we talked about, the nominal or natural variable uh, ratio, and then what a, a continuous and a discrete variable is, uh, and what they are, okay? So then we talk about the real limits. Uh, so when we start talking about intervals, um, we'll have to use our real limits that we talked about. Again, that uh, real limit for a continuous variable. So if our continuous variable was 50, uh, that was that um, value of 50. Our lower real limit would be 49 and a half. The upper real limit would be 50 and a half. Those are our limits for 50. Okay, so we'll talk more a little bit about that when we talk about uh, how we um, develop our grouped frequencies. We'll talk about that moving forward, all right? So frequency distributions and then frequency distribution tables. Um, so a frequency distribution table is just a, a way to organize data, tabulate data, uh, and it makes it look a little bit better, right? So if I'm given 100 scores, um, say I'm given 100 GPAs, right? Um, you know, some GPAs are going to be very weak, and then you're going to have some individuals who have the same GPA. I want to be able to aggregate and organize a tabulation of the, the GPAs in a particular way. Uh, so if I have uh, 50 people with a 3.3 GPA, another 25 people with a 4.0 GPA, I can again create a frequency table to identify what the and how I tabulate um, those particular scores. Um, the frequency distribution shows the number of individuals located in each individual category, right? So in our class, we might have 10 individuals. We have four females, we have five males. That would be a way to, to, to distribute, right? So if we have six females, we have five males, four females, and three males. Again, we can tabulate that and show it in a frequency distribution. A frequency distribution. It can be in either a table format or a graph, and I'll show you both um, as we move forward. 
it's always going to show you the frequency distribution table or graph. It's always going to show you the set of categories that make up the original measurement scale. Okay, and a frequency um, is a number of the individuals in each category. So when you think about what a frequency count is, uh, again, if we have a class full um, of ten people, we have five men, uh, four feet, or five uh, women. Again, those are our two categories. We have five and five. Okay, so that would be our frequency count or the number of individuals in each category, male uh, and female. Okay, here is an example of a frequency table. So this is a frequency table. Again, on the, on the left here, you have the scores. So uh, score five, score six, and score seven. And then on the right hand, on this second column here, you have your frequency counts, right? So two people score five, Three people score six, and two people score a seven. Okay, um, so you know those things are going to be really important um, as we move forward, just to kind of know how to read, how to read uh, those things that are important. Okay. All right. So here's our frequency bar or chart. Okay. Again, it's just indicating in graphical form, pictorial form, what this is showing. Right, so you have two people who score five. You have on the uh, x axis here, you have your categories or your scores. On your y axis, you're usually going to have your frequencies. Right, so uh, if it's a larger number of scores and a larger number of frequencies, this chart or this bar chart could be a little different, it could be a little larger. Uh, but again, on your x axis here, you know, have your categories or your scores, and then your frequency count on your frequencies. All right. So when you think about a frequency distribution table, uh, the frequency distribution table is going to uh, be very, very standard. Okay, very, very standard. So we saw in the previous example, you have your scores. Okay, on the left, that the first column, you have your frequencies on your second column. Okay, um, the structure of a frequency distribution table, again, very, very similar. Like I said, very, very standard. The categories and the column are often ordered from highest to lowest, or um, it, it really, really depends on the person, right? So in this particular case, this one is ordered lowest to highest, right? It can be highest, lowest. It just depends on how you want to depict the information in that particular table. Your frequency count, or the F, is going to be uh, next to the category of the X values, okay? So this could be, um, your X values or even just categories, right? So this could be uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, right? You could identify them as nominal variables or uh, as scores for your X values, okay? Um, when you look at the summation, right? This is the summation or summation of the frequencies. All you're doing is you're adding your frequencies to get your big N. This big N, if you can recall from chapter one, big N is the total number for a population, had this been a small n, this would be a sample, okay? So essentially this is a sample from your population, and the total number of this population is set, okay, the total number of frequencies, all right? To compute the sum of the scores, right? So all I'm, I'm not going to just sum five, six, and seven, because that's not the summation of the scores. Right, I have seven individuals in this particular population, and each of them has a score. So, in order to sum eight, sum the scores, I have to be able to identify the individual scores for each individual person. And that's what I'm going to sum. I'm not summing this, so I'm not going to sum the five to six, which is eleven. It's not going to be eighteen. No, that's incorrect. When you sum the scores from a table, you have to determine what the total number of scores is for each individual category, and then you sum. So in this case, the second table, I know I have two fives, two people who scored five, three people who scored a six, two people who scored a seven, right? So if I'm going to sum, I want to multiply the number of scores by the score itself, right? So I have two fives, three sixes, two sevens. So I have 10, 18, and 14. And if I want to get the sum of the scores, then I just sum all these up 
that's 10, 28 plus 14 is 42. So that would be the sum of total scores. All right. So again, when you're looking at the sum of the scores, I'm not adding these. I'm adding the total number of scores, which we're going to be multiplying these two together to get here 42. All right. All right. So some other columns that you could add, and I'll show you an example of this. Some other columns that you'll add to um, your frequency distribution table include your proportion um, and your percentage. So your proportion is just a fraction, all right? It's going to show you uh, the frequency count, and that's going to be divided by the total number of uh, individual scores in that particular population, okay? So the F over N, and then you have what we call relative frequency. Your relative frequency, again, is called a relative frequency because it describes the frequency in relation to the total number. So this portion is what we also call a relative frequency. All right. And then you have percentages. The way that you calculate percentages, you get your proportion and you multiply that proportion times 100. Multiplying that proportion times 100 gives you your percentage. OK. Again, you can include, again, separate columns. Frequency distribution so you'll have a column for your proportion. You'll also have a column for your percentages. And um, you can also have a cumulative uh, proportion, a cumulative percentage, and a cumulative frequency. And we'll talk about those as we move forward. Okay. So in this table, you have your first column, which is your value, which is your scores. You have your frequency counts here. And again, this usually is not presented, right? I just added this down here at the bottom so you can see the totals, but this is usually not, uh, it's not used uh, for a frequency distribution table, okay? So you have your frequency counts. One plus two is three, plus three is six, plus three is nine, plus one is 10, right? So that's the total. I have my proportion or my relative frequency for five is 0.10. Right. Again, one out of 10, 10 percent, two out of 10 is 20 percent, three out of 10 is 30, 30 and another 10 percent. If you add all these proportions up, you should get a value of one. OK. And then the second, the last thing is you multiply your proportions by 100. So 0 0.10 times 100 gives me 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, 30 and another 10, 10. And if you add all of these percentages up, you should get a total value of okay? Very, very simple, very, very straightforward, all right? All right, here's a learning check. It says, use the frequency distribution table to determine how many subjects were in the study, okay? So essentially all you're gonna have, all you do here is you're going to, um, you have your two here, plus four, plus one, so two plus two, plus four is six, plus one is seven, plus three is 10. So the value you should have gotten is 10, all right? Here's another one. It says, true or false, more than 50% of the individuals scored above three. So what you would have to do is, you would look at the frequency distribution table. Um, you see your frequency counts here and count to see, uh, again, you have 10 individuals in this particular population. So how many scored above uh, three? I right, guess six individuals scored above three. So that means that more than 50% scored above three. Um, the second one says the proportion of scores in the lowest category was uh, proportion equals three. Um, what you should have gotten in this particular case uh, is false for this one because uh, you, don't, you, should, you will not get a whole number or your proportion will always get a decimal point, okay? Uh, so three out of 10 should give you 0.3 and not um, just three, all right? Let me go back. I wanna do something really quickly. Um, so let's think through this. I'm going to, let me get my values really quick and I'm going to show you how to do a cumulative frequency and a cumulative proportion, all right? So you have x, five, four, three, two, one. 
F one, two, three, three, one. You got P is point one, point two, point three, point three, point one. Um, and then you have your percentage. Okay, percent 10, 20, 30. All right, so I'm going to recreate this. Let me stop sharing this screen, and then I'm going to go and share my whiteboard. Okay, so let's do this really quickly. All right, I'm going to recreate this. It's going to be X equals 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. Um, I have my frequency. Okay, that's one, two, three, three, and then one. Okay, so if I wanted to do a, what we call a cumulative frequency, that means I'm going to add, and I'll show you. So I'll do C, F. Okay, all I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the bottom. And I'm going to add every subsequent score or every subsequent frequency, right? So I'm going to start with one, okay? One plus three gives me four, okay? That's a cumulative. Four plus three gives me seven, okay? Seven plus two gives me nine, and nine plus one gives me T, all right? So that's what we call a cumulative frequency, all right? So you start at one, you add one plus three gives you four. Then you add another three, that gives you seven. You add seven, that gives you nine. And then you add one, that gives you 10. That's what we call a cumulative frequency. It accumulates as you increase, uh, as you go up, okay? Here's, a, here's another one, right? So we did a cumulative percentage, okay? A cumulative percentage. So if you remember, if you recall our percentage, okay, was just, you got 10% here, okay? You got 20% here, Okay, you got 30% here, another 30%, and then you got another 10% here, okay? So if they ask you for a cumulative percentage, okay, I'm gonna do C, percentage, or you're gonna do the same thing we did here, right? You're just gonna do with your percentage. So here's my, I'm going to start with 10%. Okay. You add 30, you get 40. Okay. You add another 30, you get 70%. Okay. You add 20, you get 90%. And then you add 10 and you get 100%. Okay, so essentially all I'm doing is adding my percentages. I accumulate as I go up for each individual case. All right, so that is uh, cumulative frequency here, and that's cumulative percentage. And again, if you need to, uh, you know, go back, watch, watch as I do it. But again, you're going to have some problems like that. Uh, so be mindful of, uh, again, cumulative frequency and cumulative percentage. All right, let me stop sharing. And then I'll share. All right. So again, cumulative percentage, cumulative frequency. Uh, let me show you an example. Okay. 
Okay. All right, we did those. All right, 2-2, two two, section 2-2, two two, grouped frequency distribution. Okay, so when you have a number of categories that's very, very, very large, okay, and a large number of scores, large number of frequencies, sometimes it's easier to combine them into what we call grouped intervals. And we've seen this before, uh, and can, once you see it, you'll understand what we're talking about. So it makes the table a lot easier to understand, but when you group frequencies, okay, you lose information, okay? So when you, again, have individuals, say five, four, three, two, one, I know those are individual groupings, and then I have my frequency count, that's all the information, right? If I grouped individuals together, say I grouped one and three together, or yeah, one and three together, and I grouped four and five together, right? Then I'm losing information, okay? Uh, let me show you an example. Let me go back. Uh, let me go back to my whiteboard. And I'm going to have to delete. So actually, I'm not going to delete anything. All right. So if I have my frequency counts here, yeah, I'm going to delete. Or yeah, let me get this stuff off. All right. I'm just going to erase this. This is a hypothetical situation. This is just an example. This is not something that I would normally do. But say I wanted to group one through three and four to five, right? So let's do that really quick, all right? So my new X values are going to be, uh, let's say, four to five. And one to three. Okay, so my new frequency count is going to be different now, right? So I have one, two is three. So I'm just adding my frequency counts for four to five. And then from one to three, I have one, four, seven. All right. So now I've lost a lot of information, right? So if I, let's, let's erase this. So without knowing the information that I just erased, I got four to five, three people are from four to five, I have seven people from one to three. I don't know, I've lost a lot of information, so I don't know how many people scored a one, I don't know how, know how many people scored a two or three, I just know that seven people scored between one and three. I lose information, so now if, if I asked you, you know, how many people scored a two uh, on the exam? you're not going to be able to tell me. All you can do is tell me how, and because these are what we call a grouped frequency table. I've grouped numbers, and now I've grouped all of those and uh, aggregated and summed all of those frequency counts into those grouped intervals. Again, I lose a lot of information. Okay? All right. So again, individual scores cannot be retrieved, and the wider the grouping interval, the more information is lost. Okay? So if I did one through five, again, there's only 10, there's 10 frequency counts. So one through five, 10, I lose all the information. I don't know who scored a one, two, three, four, or five, because I grouped it. I made the end of four a lot larger. Okay. Okay. So here are some guidelines. Uh, but one thing that you you should do and think about when you're trying to create your own interval is that they should be relatively simple numbers, right? If I have an interval of two, maybe it's an interval of two, maybe it's an interval of five, 10, these are evenly distributed numbers. Probably not gonna do an interval of three or an interval of 14 or 23. I'm not gonna do that because again, that's very, very odd. I would do a width interval that is relatively simple numbers, two, five, 10, 15, 20. Again, I would use whole numbers and I would use very simple uh, intervals. Uh, 10 or fewer class intervals is typical. So you would group, say you have maybe five, maybe, maybe you had 25 scores, right? I'm gonna group those into 
again, maybe 10 or fewer class interviews. That's the way we would want to do it, okay? Uh, but again, you want to use good judgment use um, for specific situations. You might have more. Uh, you might have less. Again, you might have 15 class members. You might have 20 class members, just based on the number of scores that you have in your data. Okay? The bottom score in a class interval should be a multiple of the fifth, right? So, I mean, I'll show you an example of that. But if we're starting off at zero to, say, four, okay, and we're doing a class of five, that class interval is going to start off at zero, and then you're going to start at five. So it'll be five to nine, then 10 to uh, 14, then 15 to 20, okay? Or fi you know, 15 to 20, right? So, oh, no, no. Yeah, 15 to 19, excuse me, and then 20, 24, uh, 25, 29, and you know, so on and so forth. Those class numbers, again, are starting off with uh, the even number. 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, and then you have your five intervals. So 0 to 4 is five units. You got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, okay? And then you have 5 to 9, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's getting five units, but you have a class number of, again, five. All right? When you construct um, a frequency distribution, or a grouped frequency distribution for discrete variables. Very, very complicated, very, very simple, okay? All you're doing is you're adding um, categories, and then you're just gonna group, uh, you're gonna group those categories. Individuals, the same uh, recorded score, uh, are gonna be precisely the same measure. Uh, the score is, again, the exact score, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, All right, so yeah, again, uh, when the score uh, is very discreet, again, the individuals with the same um, recorded score, um, again, have precisely the same measure, right? So if you have, let's say, um, I have individuals who are out of 100 um, throwing baseball, and I want to see how many times they hit the ball, okay? So if I have two individuals who hit the ball once, Another five individuals hit the ball 15 times, right? Each individual, that's a discrete variable because I can't hit the ball one and a half times, right? I have to hit the ball like one or zero, or uh, maybe I hit all, all 100 times, but every individual score is discreetly placed. So if I have two individuals who hit, hit it 10 times, I put the 10 there and then I put the two, right? So again, you have your scores. And then you have um, your frequency counts on the uh, second column. All right, so constructing a frequency distribution or constructing free frequency distribution, excuse me, uh, for continuous variables requires an understanding um, that a score actually represents an interval. Okay, the interval is that real limit. So we talked about this before um, the example of 50. So if I have a score of 50, the real limit for that score of 50 is 49 and a half and 50 and a half. Again, those are my real limits. So a given score actually could have been any value in the score's real limits, right? So again, think about the rounding thing, right? So if the score was um, 40 and a half, we're going to round it up oftentimes, or 49 and a half, we're going to round it up to 50, right? If the score is uh, 50.4, we're going to round that down to 50, right? So it can be any in any of those, because again, we talk about continuous variables, there's the decimal places in between the, the intervals. The recorded value is rounded off, again, to the middle value between the scores real limits. Again, if I have a, uh, let's say I got a 50.3 on the exam, I round it down to 50, right? Because again, yeah, points do matter, but all you do is round down again down to that real limit of 50. Okay. So individuals the same recorded score probably differ a little slightly um, in their actual measurements, right? So the measurements are simply located uh, in the same number. So if I am let's say five, I'm five seven and 
three quarters, right? Um, and then somebody is five, seven, and uh, seven eighths, right? We're probably going to round this up to five eight, right? But again, they're very, very different values. We're just in that area. We're just in that particular area, okay? So those are things that we have to be mindful of to think about continuous variables. Okay, constructing grouped frequency distributions for continuous variables. Again, also requires understanding that score actually represents. Same thing, okay? So consequently, when you're grouping several scores, it actually requires that you group several intervals as well, okay? So there's also a limit, okay? So the limit for a class interval and the class interval, so in our example, we have five units, zero to four, five to five to nine, 10 to 14, those are our class intervals. The interval for zero to four. Now, let me show you, let me see if I can write uh, so it doesn't uh, mess me up. Okay, so if I have uh, a class interval of zero to five, okay, the class interval for this one, it says uh, the class interval are always one unit smaller than the real limits of the grouped class interval. Okay, so this one would be zero actually let's go let me do let me do something because the interval for this one is not going to be the same. Let's do this. Okay. So we're going to do on the other side We're going to do five and nine, five to nine. Okay, so this one's going to be have a upper limit of nine and a half, and this one should have a smaller limit of four and a half. Okay, so if you subtract the nine and a half minus four and a half. You should be five. Okay. Same thing here. This is five, six, seven, eight, nine. That is a unit. That's my, again, these are units. Okay. Five units. Again, be smaller than the real limit of the group. So, again, this unit, okay, is smaller than the class interval, right? That's my interval here, or that real limit is on the outside. So, it should be smaller. Okay. And I'll go back again. It says apparent limits of the grouped class interval. So these are my this is my class interval are always one unit smaller than the real limits of the grouped class interval. Okay. So again, this is one unit smaller than this class interval. Okay. So it looks like this is supposed to be four, but in actuality, it is five. So here's a Example, again, I just showed you how you do that. It says a grouped frequency distribution table has categories 0 to 9, 10 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39. What is the width of the interval? So, again, that width of the interval has those particular points or units that we talked about. So, the, the, what you should have got here is 20, 21, 22. 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29. So you should have 10. Okay. So 29 and a half on the outside here. So you got 29 on the outside of the interval here. Then you have 19 and a half on the other side. So 29 and a half minus 19 and a half should give you 10. Okay. It says a set of scores ranges from a high of x equals 86 to a low of x equals 17. If these scores are placed in a grouped frequency distribution table with an interval width of 10 points, the top interval in the table would be blank. Okay. So again, 10 points. We just talked about that in the previous slide. 
10 points. What does that interval look like? You should have selected A. Okay. So again, it's going to go from 10 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39. 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 69, um, 69, or uh, 69, 70 to 79, 80, 89. And then if you, that's again, it's the highest score, so that'll be your uh, your highest uh, range there. Okay. True, false. It says the side of the following, following statement, true, false. You can determine how many individuals had each score from a frequency distribution table. Okay. You should have selected false. I mean, it's true. Excuse me. Okay, so that one should be true. The second one says you can determine how many individuals had each score for a root frequency distribution table. That one should be false. Okay. Um, again, as when you talk about grouping a frequency distribution table, you're losing a lot of information, and so oftentimes you don't know um, the number of scores in a group distribution table for the individual number of scores for each individual person. Okay. All right. So for frequency distribution graphs, and we'll talk about a few of them. Okay. You have pictures of data organized into tables. And then you, again, you're always going to have two axis axes. Okay. The first axis is the X axis or the app system. Okay. This typically category has categories of the measurement scale increasing from left to right. So again, these are oftentimes going to have your scores or your categories listed at the bottom. And then your frequency or your frequencies will be on the y axis, kind of what we talked about uh, in, in section one, section two point, excuse me. Okay. But again, the values will increase from zero uh, all the way up. Okay. At the intersection of the x and the y axis, that is your zero value. Okay. And then the height of the x of the y should be about three-fourths of uh, the length of the x-axis. So oftentimes your, um, your x-axis will be a little uh, shorter uh, than your y-axis will. Okay? So again, it's going to be a little bit taller um, than your y-axis is long. Okay? All right. So here are some graphing questions. Okay? You want to understand, like, what is the level of measurement? Okay, is it nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio? That gives you an, uh, an idea of what you should and what kind of graph you should use. Line graph, bar graph, uh, histogram, uh, pie chart. What are what are the, the levels of measure? All right? If it's something that's a little more nominal and you're looking at a uh, nominal variable, like here, this is a nominal variable. Right? So you have part-time jobs for your students. Right? So you got babysitting here. Fast food, delivery, lawn maintenance, grocery store, uh, and tutoring, right? So these are nominal variables. These are names and categories. Uh, so I have uh, eight individuals, students that babysit. I have 14 that do fast food, 12 do delivery. Uh, I have 10 that do lawn maintenance. Uh, I have 13 that do grocery work at a grocery store. And I have uh, five that, that do tutoring. Right. So again, that is a bar graph. This is what we call consider what we call a bar graph. Okay. Um, then you have what we call a histogram. So look at the difference. The bar graph, you have your nominal variables here. There are spaces in between each of the categories. For a histogram, there are no spaces. And usually histograms are used for continuous variables. Okay, continuous variables. Right. So you have a number of students number of students, but you have height listed. So individuals, you got 48, 50, uh, 52, uh, 64, 56, uh, 58, 60, 62, and 64, right? So you have each of these in an interval, right? So you have uh, that's five individuals who are uh, have a height of 48. Um, you got four who are 50 inches tall, right? So on and so forth. So the height of students, these are your histograms. Again, height is a continuous variable. It, it has various decimals in between uh, each of those. All right. But again, you answer these questions and it gives you an idea of what graph, uh, what type of table or graph you should use.
Okay, so when you're using graphs uh, for interval to ratio data, again, it requires numerical scores uh, measured on an interval or ratio scale. If you want to know, again, what ratio, ordinal, interval, go back to chapter one to kind of get a, get a better grasp of that. Okay, um, you're going to include all scores, frequency of zero. Okay, uh, you draw, excuse me, bars above each score. Okay, so the height of the bar scores from the frequency. Continuous variable to the bar extends to the real limits of that category. Again, if we go back, so these are my real limits, okay? And it's going to extend out to the right or to the left equally um, to the middle, okay, of those particular categories. And for discrete variables, again, it just extends exactly halfway distance uh, to the adjacent category of each side, okay? So I'll give you some examples of that uh, as we move forward. Okay, so here is a histogram, and we talked about it. Here is my category, and all of them is extending. These are my real limits, right? You got one and a half uh, on the left hand side, two and a half on the right hand side. Those are my real limits. Let me uh, get my pen so you can see what I'm referring to. Okay, so this is, uh, this would be 0 0.5. This is one and a half. This is two and a half. This is three and a half. These I'm just writing out my real limits. This is four and a half. And this is five. Okay. So again, you see that these values, um, again, this is midway point between the lower real limit and the upper real limit for each value there. Um, and we'll talk also about uh, the shape of certain distributions. Um, so if we're looking at the shape of this one, this probably would be a negatively skewed distribution. So I'll show you uh, what that means. All right, grouped data, um, data grouped into class intervals. Uh, again, the bars are above each grouped class interval. We'll talk about what that means uh, and the bar width is the class interval real limits. So we'll talk about that, okay? Uh, there are pair of limits that extend out one half score unit at each end of the interval. So again, just like we, so we show for um, the nine and a half um, and then the zero and a half, right? Um, you have your real limit, okay? Uh, so again, we talk about that a lot because you wanna be able to identify what the real limits are and how to how to design or construct your uh, your class. Okay. So again, this is my interval here, right? It's following into those intervals. This is thirty one and a half here. Uh, this should be twenty nine and a half, right here. This should be thirty one and a half. Okay, so that's one of my real limits on the on outside of those intervals, right? So this would be 30 and a, 29 and a half, 31 and a half, uh, 31 and a half on the outside, a little real limit here, 33 and a half, again, so on and so forth. Those are uh, those midpoints that and extends out to those real limits of those intervals, all right? Okay. Um, a standard histogram. So we talked about, again, go back. This is what we call a standard histogram. I'm going to delete this stuff out. Okay. But this is what you consider a standard histogram. Okay. The standard histogram, uh, smooth bars, they all touch. Um, that's what a histogram is. Okay. But um, you could also create a histogram that is more informal, um, where there are each individual block represents a individual or individual score. Uh, so this is what we'd consider a informal histogram, where you have each individual block represents a score. So you have, uh, these are my scores located on the x-axis. Um, this one person scored one, three people scored two and three, four, four people scored four, two scored five, one person scored six, and nobody scored a seven, all right? Um, constructing a polygon. Okay, I'm not going to go through these in a lot of detail, uh, but for the polygon, 
uh, each dot um, is above the center of each interval. Okay, so when you think about um, uh, an, an interval, uh, when you're thinking about um, just individual scores, each polygon is going to represent each individual score. Okay, and you'll see uh, what the polygon looks like. Okay, you can also use the same thing for a group frequency distribution data. Again, you're going to put that um, that that dot right above the interval, uh, in the center of the interval, and then you'll draw lines for each of two, each of the dots. And I'll show you what it looks like. So you're going to connect the dots uh, with a continuous line, and you're going to close uh, the polygon to the lines of Y equals zero. Okay. This is what that looks like. So Y equals zero here. So you have one person has one, two people have two, four people have uh, three, uh, two have four, two score to five, uh, one score to six, and nobody score to seven. But you connect the dots, continuous line, and that's what you consider the polygon. Okay, it's a shape. All right. Another polygon for a group frequency. As you can see, uh, when you have four to five, okay, this is four to five. You center it right in the middle of your uh, your interval here. Six to seven, right in the center. Eight to nine, uh, ten to eleven, and then twelve to thirteen, right into right into the center. These are my frequency counts. I'm getting connected dots. This is zero up to those points, and it's continuous. Okay, different polygon. Again, bar graphs. Okay, we talked about bar graphs. The bar graph we saw for the number of students and the type of job they have. Right, that's a bar graph. It's a nominal variable, very categorical, nominal ordinal. You use a bar graph. Very, very similar to a histogram. However, there are spaces between the adjacent bars that indicate the discrete categories. Okay. Um, again, without any particular order. So for uh, when, you went, when you go back to the uh, the number uh, for the jobs, babysitting, tutoring, grocery store, um, there are no particular order. You just put them in, you can put them in alphabetical order, you can put them in random order. Uh, but again, it just shows you the frequency counts for those particular variables. Um, and then you have what we call non measured measure widths. When you talk about ordinal, there, there is no uh, particular width uh, between those ordinal variables. Again, they're just arbitrarily placed um, in the graph. Okay. So here's one for personality type. Um, this is given A, B, C. Um, so you have personality type A, B, C. Uh, Ten people had personality type A. Five people had B. Uh, Two hundred people had personality type C. But again, there is no uh, particular order. These are just categories. Uh, your frequency counts so on the left hand side. Okay. Uh, one issue that can arise uh, with um, individual graphs is the uh, the use or misuse of graphs, okay? So in this particular example, you have uh, two individuals, right? You have a mayor who's running for mayor, and then you have a candidate who's running for mayor, and they're looking at the number of homicides in a particular city, okay? This candidate misused the graph because he used a certain interval, which looks like from 2016, 2017, 2018, there were huge, huge jumps in the um, huge jumps in the homicide rate uh, or the number of homicides each year that the candidate or the mayor was in, in office, right? So he wants to show that homicides went up and in a drastic number, okay? But the mayor wants to show that no, this one's incorrect too because, man, these intervals are way too large. You got 0 to 200, 200 to 400, 400 to 600. You're not even using uh, anything, any of these other intervals, right? So we shouldn't use anything like that. This one's probably a little more accurate than this, but I would probably do. Um, since they're, you know, 28, 218, 225, 229, I might go up by twos, maybe. You know, yeah, I would probably go to twos, right? That would probably be a little more accurate if you, you would depict the values a little more accurately. 
this is not correct, this is not correct, because again, both of these, you know, they can be misleading, right? So you want to use your intervals. Um, you want to you use them in the right way, um, especially your frequency table intervals. You want to use them so that it looks and depicts a more accurate uh, image of what's happening. Okay. So when you're looking at graphs for the population distributions, usually a population distribution is going to show you, um, you know, especially if it's something really, really small, the scores for each individual member is going to construct your frequency distribution graph, such as a histogram or a bar graph. However, if you have a population that's large, then the scores for each member are not possible. So you're going to use a what we call relative frequency, and you're going to use a smooth curve. Let me show you what that looks like on the next slide. Uh, a normal distribution, and we'll talk a little more about this when we move into chapter ten or uh, chapter three. Excuse me. Normal distribution is a symmetrical, uh, a symmetrical graph where you have a lot of frequency distributions in the middle and it tails off into the end. So it's kind of a bell curve. If you know what a bell curve looks like, that is a normal distribution. This is a common data structure for many, many, many variables. Uh, height, weight, um, SAT scores, AC ACT scores. You have a lot of people in the middle and you have a lot of, um, uh, you have fewer people on the tails, right? So for height, you got a lot of people with average height, and then you have a lot of people who, you have a few people who are really, really tall, and you have a few people who are uh, really, really, really short. Okay. And this last one that says it's most important, uh, it is the most important probability distribution of statistics because it accurately describes the distribution of values for many natural phenomena. So, again, IQ score, height, weight. Forearm length, all of those things are um, natural phenomena that we see in, uh, in the world. Okay. So here is a bar graph, right? Relative frequencies. Uh, when you have someone, something that is, again, you don't want to use uh, numbers, you can use percentages, right? So uh, this is a, a graph of individuals, their point of view for their particular pet. So 60% of people. Say that they view their pet as family as a family family member, right? I view my my dog as a family member, right? Or a companion, right? So about twenty, what is that? Thirty percent or so view their their pet as a companion. Very few people uh, view their pet as property. I, I didn't view my, my pet as a property as a piece of property, right? It was family, it was my companion, or both, right? Here is a population distribution. Um, here are SAT scores in 2020. You see that this is what we call a normal distribution, right? You have a lot of individuals who score average SAT scores in the middle here, and then fewer and fewer people as you get to the higher scores, there's fewer and less and less, and less and less score, very, very low scores. And here are IQ scores. So instead of, uh, you know, we, if we're looking at IQ scores for the, uh, for the world, again, a very, very smooth curve. Right for the population, that's what we call a normal distribution. Okay, a lot of middle in the middle, scoring a lot in the middle 100, and then fewer, fewer people scoring higher, just IQs, fewer scoring very, very. Okay, so here are some examples of those natural phenomena that I've talked about height, blood pressure, uh, measurement error, IQ scores are all kind of located on that natural, uh, natural phenomena or the, the normal distribution. Uh, curve. Okay. So when you think about different shapes, okay, you have three different shapes that we'll talk about. You have what we call a normal shape, you have a positive skew, and you have a negative skew. Okay. So a symmetrical distribution, each side is a mirror image of the other. That's what we call a normal distribution. Um, and then you have a skewed distribution. Now I'll show you some examples of each of these. The scores pile up on the side. Uh, and taper off uh, in the tail of the other, right? So when the tail is on the right-hand side, that's what you call a positive skew. When the tail is on the left-hand side, that's when you call you have a, a you call a negative skew. And the 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 tail points to the sign. So I'll show you that in in the next slide. Okay. 
So here are some metric distributions. This is a normal distribution here. Here's a bimodal distribution, right? Or you go, once you, you slice this in half and you flipped it, that would be, they would flip and they would be symmetrical, okay? Here is a positive distribution, right? So when you look at a positive distribution, the tail is pointing to the sign. All of our positive numbers are going to the right. All of our negative numbers go to the left. So this is a positive distribution. This will call it a negative distribution, okay? So the sign is pointing to the left, all okay? right? So again, let me put in my pen. Uh, this is negative numbers going that way. Positive numbers this way, negative numbers going that way, positive, positive numbers that way. So the tail, okay, is pointing to the sign. So, right, so this is going to the negative. This is going towards the positive. So it's a positive. Okay. Get my laser pointer. All right. And I don't need these, so let me erase. All right, so just as a learning check, it says, what is the shape of this distribution? Again, I just showed you, and if you, one of the easiest ways to do this is you have the pen. I see that that's, that's my negative side there. I'm not sure why it's, that's doing that. But you have your negative sign here, and you have your positive sign there. Again, the tail points to the sign. I mean, the, 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 the tail points to the sign of the skew. So I'm going this way. The tail is pointing to the positive. This should be a positively skewed distribution. Okay. It says the population of the states of the United States would have what kind of skew distribution? Okay. Well, depending upon how you graph your uh, distribution of the state. Right. We're looking at these different states, California, New York, Texas, New Hampshire, Alabama, all of the 50 states. What is the skew? Right. You're going to have a lot of states with large populations. You're going to have some with very, very small populations like Delaware has a very, very small population. California has the largest population. New York, Texas, they have larger populations. You should see, and I'll show you, a positive skew distribution. All right. So you have California, Texas, Florida, New York. Again, it's a positive skew distribution. All right. That's a trick question. Uh, because again, you could have California, Texas, Florida on the right hand side, and that skew goes uh to the negative. So again, you could have it in. All right. All right, says so the side of the following should say Mr. True or False. It says it would be correct to use a histogram to graph parental marital status and uh, from a treatment center for children. The second one says it would be correct to use a histogram to graph the time children spent playing with other children from data collected in a children's treatment center. Okay, you can pause it, figure it out. The answer number one should be false. So marital status is a nominal variable, so you would not use a histogram. You would more likely use a bar. And for the second one, if you're using time, time is considered a continuous variable and an interval variable. So then you would use a histogram for that uh, particular variable. All right. 2-4, you're almost to the end of STEM and LEAP displays. All right. So... Stem and leaf display is a simple, very, very simple alternative to the grouped frequency distribution table or graph, okay? Uh, so when you're using a group distribution, you can use what we call a stem and leaf display. Each score is separated by or into two parts. You have your stem, which is on the left-hand side. You have your leaf, which is on the right-hand side. The first digit or digits is called the stem and the last digit is called the leaf, okay? So again, in an example, you have X equals 85. So if I were to do a stem and leaf plot, 
I draw a line down the middle. I have my eight over here, which is in the that's the stem, and then my five would be um, in the leaf. Say I had 89, 87, or some other values. Doing that. Say I was yeah, 80, 87, I'm just going to three of them. 87. And let's say 86. And I'll do it. And it will be 88. Okay. So I'm just going to do a stem and leaf plot, right? So every individual score cannot be identified. So I got my 85, which is the first one. I got 86. I got 87. 88. And then 89. Okay, so those are my values here. All right, so I got 85, 86, 87, 88, 89. This is my leaf, and this is my stem. Okay. All right, so it says for the score shown in the stem and leaf display. What is the lowest score in the distribution? First thing you would do, uh, again, these are my stem. This is the stem. This is the leaf. Okay, so as an example, um, this would be 93, 97, 94. Okay, so which one is the lowest score? You should have gotten. 51, okay? So I got five here, and I got my one, right? So 51 is the lowest score. The highest score would be what? Should be 97, okay? All right, so it says, for the scores shown in the following stem and leaf display, how many people had scores in the 70s? Okay, if you go to 70s, you should see here, okay, and what is your answer? Should have been four, okay? You got 70, 72, 74, and 77. Those are four scores. So, again, those are your four uh, people. Or so, how many people? Four people had scores. In the True and false. It says any frequency distribution is suitable for a stem and lead display. And then the second one is a score of 54 is displayed as five for the stem and four for the leaf and a stem and display. Okay, you can pause it, think about it. The answer is coming next. Okay. So false for the first one. It says a stem and leaf display is a simple alternative for a grouped frequency distribution. Okay. So again, you can use it for a group frequency distribution. Okay, to kind of group your numbers into um, those values. Okay, so you're grouping it into seven. Uh, as we go back, you got your groups here, nine, eight, seven, six, five, these groups, and then you group them into these individuals. But you can identify the number of people who had, and you can identify individual scores, which is an easy way to do that. And then the second one is true. Again, the five is the stem. Um, the four is the leaf. All right. That is chapter two, frequency distributions. Again, very, very straightforward. Um, be mindful that you will have uh, homework uh, this week uh, to be due uh, on this Sunday, coming Sunday, um, from chapters one and chapter two. Uh, we covered all of chapter one and just finished covering chapter two. Next week, uh, we'll cover chapter three. Uh, which is going to be very, very fun. Um, we'll talk about um, measures of central tendency, mean, median, mode, range, all of those things that we talked about. Uh, but I hope um, you got a lot from this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to email me at r-a-u-y, period, barbara, b-a-r-b-o-u-r, at a-a-w dot e-u, or uh, you can give me a call at 
372-1112 if you have any questions. Again, I'm always available to help. Uh, you all have a great one. Uh, happy studies and good luck on uh, your practice questions for chapter two and on the uh, homework you'll have to do this weekend.